What happened after the last monarch of a Greek dynasty in Egypt passed away? What happened when a woman notorious for her relationships with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, two iconic Roman generals, passed away? What happened when one of the greatest female leaders in human history passed away? To cut a long story short, a lot. After Nectanebo II's rule, Egypt did not get another native ruler until 1952. The Persians broke in the doors and turned Egypt into a satrapy, which is just a difficult word for the province. The Egyptians rebelled against their imperial overlords to no avail. When Alexander the Great set out from Macedonia and arrived in Egypt, he did not have to wage war. The people viewed him as a liberator and helped him overthrow the Persians. After Alexander's death, his kingdom was divided among his generals. One of these generals was Ptolemy, who became the ruler of Egypt and commenced the Ptolemaic dynasty. You might be asking, quite rightly I should add, why were the Egyptians all right with this arrangement? The amicability between the Egyptians and Greeks can be ascertained from a tale from Herodotus. Pharaoh Apries led his men against the Greek colony of Cyrene in Libya. After he lost, his men crowned Amasis, an Egyptian general, their leader. Apries gathered his forces, including Greek mercenaries, to reclaim his throne, but was defeated by Amasis. Pharaoh Amasis ensured the Egyptians stayed on good terms with the Greeks. He even sent money to rebuild the charred temple of the Greek oracle at Delphi. The Egyptians also coveted favor from the Athenians and the Delian League against the onslaught of the Persians. After the Persian conquest of Egypt, revolts began sprouting all over the land. One could easily see why the arrival of a great savior heralded a new Egyptian dawn. Egyptians were quick to welcome the Greeks, and even though the Ptolemies did not mingle with the locals, they were not considered a threat. Thus began the Ptolemaic era of ancient Egypt that would end with the death of Cleopatra VII. Like most royal families, the Ptolemies wanted to keep their bloodline pure, so they intermarried. Cleopatra was the likely product of generational interbreeding, and no, she probably wasn't black. If you're interested, we've done a video on that subject. Cleopatra was the first Ptolemaic leader who knew the Egyptian language. A papyrus dating back to 35 BCE refers to her as Philopatris, she who loves her country. She ascended to the throne at the tender age of 18 and made the Library of Alexandria her second home. She learned several languages and engaged with the centuries-old traditions of politics, philosophy, astronomy and mathematics. To understand what happened after the death of this learned woman, we must contextualize the world as she found it. And if we are to talk about her children, we must also discuss her run-ins with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. This was a world of political intrigue, Roman ascendancy and declining Greek city-states. It was a world where siblings backstabbed each other. Oh, and let's not forget et tu, brute. Sorry for spoiling the death of Julius Caesar, but if you haven't read Shakespeare by now, you should not be allowed to watch English language content. Hashtag, sorry, not sorry. Cleopatra's siblings had forced her to leave Alexandria for Syria. Caesar arrived in Alexandria to negotiate a truce between Ptolemy, not Alexander's general, this is Ptolemy XIII, and Cleopatra. A thriving Egypt would have benefited the Romans as the land was chock full of resources. Ptolemy, however, could not find the temper to curb the ongoing civil war and denied his sister entry into the city. Cleopatra hid in a leather sack and was transported on a boat across a swampy marshland by a loyal fellow named Apollodorus the Sicilian. He made his way unsuspectingly to Caesar's residence and presented the sack. Plutarch claims, Caesar was first captivated by this proof of Cleopatra's bold wit and was afterwards so overcome by the charm of her society that he made a reconciliation between her and her brother on the condition that she should rule as his colleague in the kingdom. Cleopatra's siblings, Ptolemy XIII and Arsinoe, were not fans of this decision and began conspiring. When push came to shove, Caesar sided with Cleopatra and with the help of his friend Mithridates of Pergamum, defeated the Alexandrian and Ptolemaic armies. Caesar crowned her the new pharaoh, the two fell into love, and Cleopatra gave birth to Caesarion. A few years later, Caesar was assassinated, and to Cleopatra's disappointment, Caesarion was not mentioned in his will, nor was Mark Antony, his trusted protégé. Mark Antony was sent on military campaigns and had requested reinforcements from Egypt on multiple occasions, a request Cleopatra had failed to oblige, 
He sent word for a meeting with Cleopatra, who made a grand entrance, far more glamorous than his first meeting with Caesar. She arrived with hundreds of ships filled with gold, jewels, and gifts. It wasn't long before she was pregnant with twins, Antonys. She named them Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene II. They had another son a few years later, Ptolemy Philadelphus XVI. Mark Antony never saw eye to eye with Caesar's successor Octavian, and eventually the two came to blows. The Battle of Actium in 31 BCE had them at each other's throats. Octavian defeated the vaunted Roman general and conquered Alexandria to the chagrin of the Egyptian queen and her lover. Cleopatra went into hiding and sent word to Antony that she had committed suicide. In the words of the Roman poet Horace, she dared endure the sight of her realm in ruins, her face serenely calm, and had the strength to handle stinging serpents to absorb their black venom into her body, fiercer as she resolved to die. No wonder she begrudged the fierce Liburnian sailors and was no woman to be deposed and humbly led in splendid triumph. The question of her death has long been pondered over. Egyptian folklore claims that she committed suicide from an asp bite. No one knows clearly in what way she perished, for the only marks on her body were slight pricks on the arm. Some say she applied to herself an asp which had been brought into her in a water jar, or perhaps hidden in some flowers. Others declare that she had smeared a pin with which she was wont to fasten her hair, with some poison possessed of such a property that in ordinary circumstances it would not injure the body at all, but if it came into contact with even a drop of blood would destroy the body very quietly and painlessly, and that previous to this time she had worn it in her hair as usual, but now had made a slight scratch on her arm and had dipped the pin in the blood. Cassius Dio, the Roman historian, upon learning that his lover had perished, Antony ordered his slave Eros to kill him. Eros instead turned the sword to himself and committed suicide. Antony followed suit. Then there was the matter of the queen's children. Caesarion was a thorn in Octavian's side, so Cleopatra dispatched him east. He spent eighteen days as the pharaoh before being intercepted by the Romans. Octavian had Caesarion killed later, after Cleopatra's death. Plutarch. The Roman historian Cassius Dio claims that Octavian spared Alexander Helios and Ptolemy Philadelphus after parading them in front of Roman crowds. Octavian's sister and Mark Antony's fourth wife, Octavia, were overcome with sympathy and took the children under her wing. Cleopatra Selene married Juba II of Nubidia, a North African king. She settled in Caesarea and brought tons of Egyptian art and sculpture with her. Her entourage brought the Greek language to the courts and established a circle of scholars. Her husband was also an erudite man and participated in the court's scholarly interests. His works, Libica and On Arabia, proved instrumental sources of North African history for historians. The couple had two children, maybe. The existence of one child, Ptolemy of Mauritania, is known, and another child, Drusilla, is indicated in some sources. Ptolemy of Mauritania rose to the throne after the deaths of his parents. Roman records claim that he was luxuriant, indecisive, and looked down on Roman kings. The Roman emperor, Caligula, summoned him to his court, for he had been issuing gold coins, a prohibited activity. Things unraveled shockingly, and the last Ptolemy was executed. The Mauritanian population did not take kindly to Caligula's actions and revolted. The Romans had to go in and crush revolts in the region for several years. The protests were of no use, however. The bottom line remained the same. The Ptolemaic bloodline had fizzled out. What became of Egypt, you ask? It went from the Persians to the Greeks and now to the Romans. Octavian annexed it as a Roman province and placed one Cornelius Gallus in charge. The Ptolemaic Empire was gone, dismembered and distributed. Roman kings and their allies made their cases and claimed different territories. The Egyptian revenue became the source of income for the Roman soldiers in the region, including the ones who had fought for Antony. Octavian considered Antony's insurrection a stain on his legacy, so he had his statues torn down. The same couldn't be done with Cleopatra's statues because they held cultural and religious significance for the locals. In Rome, she had garnered a reputation for being a seductress and a femme fatale, but in Egypt, she was a goddess. The martyred queen quickly garnered a cult. She became a figure of grace and poise, symbolizing courage in the face of danger. There were discussions about building a massive temple to honor Cleopatra, but the project fell through. According to Duane W. Roller, 
an American archaeologist and author, her cult lasted until at least 373, when the scribe of the Book of Isis at Philae, Petesenufe, reported that he overlaid the figure of Cleopatra with gold. Egypt had been Hellenized during the Ptolemaic era, so there was no need to build from scratch. The Romans envied the Greek past as much as anyone else. After Octavian rebranded himself as Augustus, he employed many political and artistic ideas that the Greeks had attempted in Egypt. Sculptures, ornaments, and domestic items from Egypt started making their way to Rome. The Egyptians had begun influencing the Romans just as they had once inspired the Greeks. Take a look at these examples of Egyptian influence. The Levant was still reeling from the aftermath of Cleopatra's death. Herod, the Judean king, received the lands he had lost to Cleopatra. Archelaus of Cappadocia and Artavasdes of Media Atropatine, allied kings who had supported Antony and Cleopatra, managed to survive. Egypt itself would go on under Roman supervision until the 7th century when the Byzantines and the Islamic conquests offered some turbulence. What do you think about Cleopatra's demise? Why do you think the Egyptians made her out to be a martyr? Did Egypt's fate lay with the Ptolemies or were the Romans better overlords for the region?